If you've ever dreamed of seeing Yellowstone wolves in the wild, this video is for you. I'm taking you inside the understanding wolf experience, sharing what wolf biologists teach you, and giving a real look at wolf watching from the legendary Lamar Buffalo Ranch. Get ready for a quick tour of the entire experience. Our journey started with a flight into Bozeman Yellowstone International Airport, a beautiful, mountain lodge style airport that is relatively small but cozy and welcoming. From there, it is about a two and a half to three hour drive to Lamar Buffalo Ranch. While a bit long, the drive is scenic, passing through mountain valleys with amazing mountain views in the distance. Once inside the park, you are surrounded by nature and, of course, buffalo. It is not uncommon to suddenly find yourself in the middle of a bison jam. Herds often use the roads as easy travel paths. If you do encounter them, obviously, stay inside your car, keep a safe distance, and wait patiently as the herd passes at its own pace. While it might add time to your drive, it's also one of the most memorable and uniquely Yellowstone experiences, being eye to eye with these iconic animals, feeling their size and presence just feet away. After some time, we finally reach our destination, the Lamar Buffalo Ranch. This is where we stayed for the four-night, five-day program. And while rustic, it is a pure privilege to stay here. The Lamar Buffalo Ranch is a truly historic, isolated location that puts you right in prime wolf country. It was originally established in 1907 to help preserve the American bison, which had been nearly hunted out. In the early 1900s, park managers counted only about 25 bison remaining in Yellowstone. And as you saw, the park is now filled with them, currently over 5,000 in population. Today, the ranch serves as a historic field campus for educational programs run by Yellowstone Forever and the National Park Service. And it is a perfect location where you are immersed in the heart of the Lamar Valley, one of the best places in the park for seeing bison, elk, wolves, and other northern range species. Accommodations are basic here. Both the bathroom and kitchen are shared facilities. Meals are not included, so you bring your own food to cook and store everything in the refrigerators and shelves in the shared kitchen. Each participant stays in one of these individual log cabins. They each have beds, a propane heater, and reading lamps. If desired, you can rent sheets and sleeping bags from the ranch. At this time of year, there is often snow, and being in the remote Lamar Valley, surrounded by mountains, the nights are magical. The sky is super clear, and stargazing is a must. As mentioned, the bathrooms are shared facilities, separated by gender. Surprisingly, the showers had great water pressure, and could get super hot. A nice way to end the day, after trekking in the cold, looking for wolves. After settling in, the next morning starts right before daybreak. The core of the program is field time, and each day, much of the morning is spent traveling throughout the park to areas where the wolves were last spotted or seen heading to. Upon reaching a potential spotting location, we used high-powered scopes and binoculars to scan the vast valley for movement or tracks. Much of the time is spent waiting and scanning to see if you can catch a glimpse as the wolves cover a lot of ground when they are on the move. But at this time of year, there are a number of avid wolf followers throughout the park, and we were constantly on the radio, sharing information on sightings. Even if you do not find the wolves initially, the beauty of the park is worth the trip. As you can see, it is cold. I think the average temperature when we were there was about 14 degrees Fahrenheit, so make sure you bring the appropriate gear. Dress in layers, moisture wicking on the interior, and waterproof outerwear. Also make sure you have good, waterproof hiking boots, warm socks, gloves, and a hat. A lot of people had heated socks, which was helpful, because we found our feet got cold quickly, standing outside on the frozen ground. Also, the Understanding Wolf program is rated as a level 3 in activity. This means be prepared for lots of hiking or snowshoeing, up to 5 miles a day in high altitude conditions. And it was true. We pretty much had to hike to various spots, looking for wolves, and then each day, there was an after-lunch hike to see different key sites in the park. 
During the day, we also met up with other wolf organizations. On the first day, we were provided an educational talk by a representative from the Yellowstone Wolf Project. The Wolf Project studies these animals year-round in the park. She explained how wolves were reintroduced in 1995 and how that decision transformed the entire ecosystem. We learned how packs work, how researchers track them, and what challenges wolves face today. After that talk, we were rewarded, spotting our first wolf in the wild. Though grainy, even with the powerful scope, it was still a thrill. And after that success, we returned from our morning out in the field, back to the Lamar Buffalo Ranch, where we ate lunch, and listened to a guest lecturer. Then, it was time for our afternoon hike, so everyone got geared up again, and we trekked out into the valley. Our destination was a large beaver dam. The hike was a great reminder that Yellowstone isn't only about wolves and bison, beavers play a huge role in shaping this ecosystem too. Beavers are true ecosystem engineers. By building dams and lodges, they slow down streams, create ponds, and form wetlands that support birds, fish, amphibians, and an incredible diversity of plant life. Their ponds provide habitat for moose, waterfowl, and even help regulate water flow during dry seasons. Interestingly, when wolves returned to Yellowstone, elk behavior changed, allowing willow and aspen to recover along streams, which in turn helped beaver populations rebound. And as we explored the area around the dam, we even came across a beaver skull, a subtle reminder of the circle of life, and how every creature, even after death, shape and nourish the Yellowstone ecosystem. The next day, we were up early, with a similar routine of trekking through the park and scoping for wolves. This time, we had amazing success, and the entire group was overjoyed. Our scopes had locked onto a group of wolves moving across the range. It was a perfect snapshot of what we were looking for in Yellowstone's wolf country. We observed how they travel with purpose. Wolves can cover 20 to 30 miles in a day, and every movement is tied to survival, patrolling territory, trailing elk, or checking on pack members. If you look closely, you may see the subtle size differences between the older and younger wolves, and how they move as a coordinated unit. In addition, you can clearly see the color variations within the pack, we have some gray individuals, and some darker, nearly black wolves. Although the same species, they have a different gene makeup, and the black wolves originally came from Canada as part of the reintroduction in 1995. Yellowstone research has shown that the most successful breeding pair is a mixed pair, one black, one gray. Their pups statistically survive better. So many packs are now mixed. Outside Yellowstone, black wolves make up roughly 1% to 10% of the population. In Yellowstone, it's often almost half the wolves in some years. Before this reintroduction, wolves were absent from this area for nearly 70 years, and watching them like this feels like witnessing history in motion. Since their return, scientists have documented entire volumes of wolf behavior, family loyalty, complex communication, and even individual personalities. Each pack has its own story, dominant breeding pairs, pups learning the landscape, and the constant push and pull of living in a wild ecosystem. And speaking of wolf pack stories, one of the most memorable moments we had in the field was meeting Rick McIntyre, widely considered the foremost expert on wolves in Yellowstone National Park. Rick began working in Yellowstone in 1994, just before wolves were reintroduced, and since then he has logged over 100,000 wolf sightings and spent decades interpreting wolf behavior for visitors and researchers alike. During our time with Rick, he shared tales of legendary wolves like Wolf 8 and Wolf 21, the intricacies of pack dynamics, the nuances of wolf communication, and how each individual wolf has a unique personality and role within the pack. He illustrated how the reintroduction of wolves changed the ecosystem, and how wolves reshaped Yellowstone's landscapes and wildlife communities. Even more exciting, he let us know that his best-selling non-fiction series, The Alpha Wolves of Yellowstone, is now being adapted into a feature film, so the stories we heard are soon going to reach an even larger audience. It was a little under wraps, as far as who was going to play him in the movie, but Matthew McConaughey was the rumor. After the seminar, it was back to spotting wolves, and the afternoon was just as amazing as the morning.
This time, we were mesmerized by some wildlife dynamics, observing the wolves, close to a few bison. Bison are some of the largest land-dwelling mammals in North America. A bull bison can weigh up to 2,000 pounds, and a cow up to 1,100 pounds, making them incredibly formidable prey. The wolf pack seems to circle around them, eyeing up the situation, but ultimately nothing happens. The bison seem unaffected, and not worried about the wolves. Hunting a bison is a highly hazardous endeavor for a pack. Wolves can easily get kicked, gored, and stomped to death by bison. A single kick from a bison can deliver a painful consequence, such as a broken jaw or other serious injury that can threaten a wolf's survival. Wolves are risk-averse, and focus on the most vulnerable prey to minimize injury. Nearly all documented bison kills are made in late winter when the bison are vulnerable due to poor condition, injury, or youth. That afternoon, we were able to see wolves traveling quickly alongside a river. It is remarkable to see how effortlessly they navigate the landscape. Wolves know every drainage, every ridgeline, every path through the park. What's also remarkable is that each generation of Yellowstone wolves inherits more than genetics, they inherit traditions. Packs teach their young specific travel routes, hunting strategies, rendezvous sites, and even which nearby packs to avoid. These aren't just instincts, they're learned behaviors passed down like family knowledge. That afternoon, Jeff Reed, co-founder of the Cry Wolf Project, presented their cutting-edge research that uses advanced recording technology and AI to decode wolf communication. They've also turned their findings into an artistic music project called Five-Toed Wolf, blending real wolf-inspired sounds into an album to support wolf conservation. And the afternoon hike was a moving experience as we headed out to visit one of the original wolf acclamation pens, the Rose Creek Pen. Just a little over a mile hike from the Lamar Buffalo Ranch, this is truly a walk through wolf history. A mecca, of sorts, to one of the four pens used to reintroduce wolves to the park in 1995 and 1996. Along the way, we reach a field covered in antlers and skulls from elk and bison. We learn about the trophic cascade, where the reintroduction of wolves impacted the elk population, which in turn affected woody plant growth. Most of the antlers collected here are from bull elk shedding their antlers from late winter to early spring. Bison, on the other hand, have been released from competition as elk numbers declined, allowing their population to increase in some parts of the park. After some time, we reach our destination. We see the pen up ahead and begin to understand why biologists chose this spot in 1995. Rose Creek sits in a perfect wolf habitat. Open visibility, nearby elk herds, water sources, and escape cover along the forest edge. Although it just seems to be remnants of original fencing, it still feels significant. This is where the modern Yellowstone wolf story began. The Rose Creek pen was one of the central acclamation pens used during the reintroduction. This specific pen held the first wolves brought from Alberta, including the famous Rose Creek pack, whose lineage would go on to shape Yellowstone's wolf population for decades. Pups born here, some to pregnant females who arrived unexpectedly carrying litters, became foundational animals in the ecosystem's recovery. Wolves in the acclimation pens were kept there for several weeks, so they could orient to the landscape, bond socially, and imprint on the Lamar Valley, instead of attempting to return north to Canada. Biologists worked in freezing temperatures, monitoring the wolves around the clock, feeding them elk carcasses lowered through the fencing so the wolves didn't associate food with humans. Many of the wolves released from the Rose Creek pen became legends, written about by Rick McIntyre. Wolf 8, a runt from another pack, was adopted by the Rose Creek mother, ultimately becoming a respected alpha. Wolf 21, a gentle, powerful alpha male, was famous for never killing a rival wolf. And Wolf 42, the strong and protective alpha female, as a leader, defined the early years of Yellowstone's wolf recovery. These pens were crucial in turning one of the most daring wildlife recovery efforts in US history into a success. Nearly every wolf seen in Yellowstone today can trace its ancestry back to one of these pen sites. Our hike continued into the evening as we were told about a unique find. There was an almost entire elk skeleton in the woods. 
probably an animal that died from exhaustion or malnutrition and was quickly scavenged. It was a pretty remarkable, as well as gruesome sight. It may look harsh at first, but this is how Yellowstone stays healthy. Carcasses return nutrients to the soil, feed dozens of species, and support a chain of life. And in the evening, another informational lecture, this time from the leader of the program, Dr. Joanna Lambert. Our final day there was once again even more rewarding than the last. We hiked in some beautiful scenery, looking for wolves. We also learned about identifying different animal tracks in the snow. The park was a winter wonderland, with snow-covered ground and bubbling streams. We were able to find a spot where you could actually see a pack of wolves with the naked eye. Small dots, like little black ants, walking across the white snow. And with the high-powered scopes, it was an unbelievable experience. Observe how the Yellowstone wolves move across this snowy terrain. Their ability to travel efficiently is a key adaptation for survival. Large paws, with wide, fleshy pads, function like natural snowshoes, distributing their weight over the snow. This makes travel far easier for them than for the primary prey, the elk or bison. This efficiency is amplified by their narrow, streamlined bodies and their social habit of traveling single file. The wolf in the lead expends the most energy to break the trail, but every subsequent wolf saves energy by stepping into the previous animal's tracks. This allows packs to cover long distances every day. And if all of those wolf sightings, lectures, and excursions were not enough, our final hike took us to an abandoned wolf den. Although dens are usually used year after year, this abandoned den was believed to have been dug in an emergency. Thus it was no longer being used. It still had some remains around, a skull and some antlers. Some of these items would have been used almost as toys for the young wolves. A few members of our group were brave enough to crawl in and take this video. It was surprisingly fairly large, almost with a few rooms, large enough for a mother wolf and her pups. Wolf dens are the birthplace of every pack's next generation. They're used only for a short, critical window each year, typically from late April through early June, when pups are too young to survive above ground. Dens give the mother a protected, hidden, temperature-stable place to nurse and shelter her newborn litter. So, is the Yellowstone Forever Understanding Wolf program worth it? If you are genuinely passionate about conservation, willing to brave the winter cold and the activity level 3 hiking, and want to blend hands-on wolf watching with high-level academic learning, the answer is an undeniable yes. It's an immersive, once-in-a-lifetime experience that transforms you into an educated witness of the ongoing story of Yellowstone wolves. Thanks for watching. Please like, follow, and subscribe.